Maura G. Hasseltine is uh, known for her sculptural renditions of microscopic life forms. She is an environmentalist and co-founder of the Green Salon, an international think tank devoted to environmental solutions. In 2007, Hasseltine created New York City's first solar-powered oyster reef. She has since devoted her attention to exploring the most efficient and beautiful designs to create oyster and coral reefs. Her current projects combine living aquatic structures with sustainable environmental technology. The sculptures function as habitat, coastline protection, and bioremediation farm filters. Hasseltine frequently collaborates with scientists, technologists, and engineers to practice geotherapy, art which heals the planet. The concept of geotherapy acknowledges that we are at the dawn of the Anthropocene age, where human-generated um, pollution create, um, threatens the habit habit habitability of the biosphere. Hasselton received her undergraduate degree from Oberlin College and her master's from the um, San Francisco Art Institute. She works out of Brooklyn. Mara, Has Mara G. Hasselton. Um, so um, thank you for the introduction. Um, my name is Mara G. Hasselton, and um, I'm an artist and an environmental advocate. Um, I work a lot with art and science, and in particular, water. So I'd like to start with this slide because I think about water all the time as we are water-based life forms. Um, and water is the main component of our biosphere and also our bodies. So one of my main goals um, with my artwork is to actually purify water. So um, I... I love the idea of um, the cell and the biosphere being synonymous with each other. So um, here's a picture of the planet, which um, the biosphere is 97% uh, water. And here's a picture of a cell. And you can see that they're very similar. So the biosphere and um, the cell. And that's going to be a constant um, theme throughout my work. So. Um, this is a, I give a lot of really specific lectures because there's a lot of science um, and research that goes behind um, most of my projects. Um, and actually, uh, this is going to be more of an overall, uh, overarching um, sort of trajectory uh, because you're students, you're about to go out into the real world, um, if there is one. And so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just, th we have a, 103 slides to get through. So I'm just going to sort of say r little snippets about each one of them. And then I'm hoping if any of you are interested in during Q&A um, in any of the topics that I um, discuss, you could um, get, you know, we can get more in depth. So. Um, so I, I'm obsessed with making the invisible visible because um, our planet and our bodies actually um, operate, um, you know, beyond what our human perception can uh, perceive. So this this um, obsession started um, with this project that I've only completed part of, um, but it is the cell garden. So the idea was to make a cell. Uh, shaped garden um, in a eukaryotic or animal cell and um, that people could wander through it and it would be a place of contemplation. Um, my mother grew up in in Tokyo and uh, post-war Tokyo and so I spent a lot of time in Japan and um, the ideals of Shintoism which I'll, I'll get to um, again and again um, as this uh, primitive um, religion that worships nature um, permeate my work. This is Ryonji, um, and it is uh, one of the most famous uh, rock gardens in Japan. And the rocks here, you can only just see the tops of them. They actually go 17 feet down. Um, and so there's this a lot of negative space. So I like to use negative space and to really just sort of just show a little bit of the science and get people's uh, minds to create their own narratives around it. And that's really what um, happens when you see uh, a rock garden like this. Um, so 
Um, when I was making the cell garden and the different components of it, uh, I became very enamored of um, Lovelock, uh, the atmospheric scientist's um, concept that the biosphere was actually a living entity like a cell or an animal and that it was self-regulating. So um, if one, if it got too hot or too acidic, then different um, elements would um, counteract that. And then I started thinking, well, what is our role um, as you know, humans in this? And so I'm just gonna read this uh, quote uh, that I think is really beautiful um, about what, how Lovelock thought of this. And this is in 1971 when the world was a lot less polluted and a lot less populated. Still more important is the implication that evolution of Homo sapiens with his technological inventiveness and his increasingly subtle communication network has vastly increased Gaia, being the earth goddess, range of perception. She is now through us awake and aware of herself. She has seen her fair face through the eyes of astronauts and television cameras of orbiting spacecraft. So this is this whole idea that um, we, um, as, as uh, with our technology, could be like the nervous system of this organism, which is the biosphere. Um, so here's a, a model for a mitochondrion, which is uh, what creates energy in the cell, and it was going to be solar-powered um, fountain. Um, and using recycled materials, this is what it would look like from the side. And then I, I began because um, I, I had actually privy to um, bioinformatics because um, actually my father was decoding the human genome. So I was able to get access to bioinformatics almost before anyone else could uh, see them. And um, so this is sort of like, I, I, the next organelle I made was um, a ribosome and that's uh, kind of like the protein factory in the cell. So the first step was um, to get the scientific data, which is a published paper, um, to make proteins. And um, proteins are sort of like what control all the functions of the cell, and they're made uh, through a sequence of amino acids. So first to, get, uh, to make a protein, you need the sequence of amino acids. In this case, it was the beta lymphocyte stimulator protein. And then I used rapid prototyping and uh, three-axis milling to fabricate uh, large-scale sculptures. And this is at a time when this was just starting, uh, about 2003. And so um, here we are in the factory making it. And here is uh, the finished sculpture, which is 84 feet long, and a sort of a stop action of um, the uh, protein getting made, it's called waltz of the polypeptides. Um, so this is a ribosome, and they look kind of, I, I purposely made them look sort of like dancing figures because it's about birth and life. But um, scientists, when they see them, also recognize them as ribosomes. And then here's the finished protein that separates from the ribosomes. That was a ribosome making a polypeptide, which is a nascent protein. So the, these are ribbon diagrams of proteins. So proteins are so small, you, 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 can't, can only, you can't see them through a regular microscope. They're just like, this is just showing the energy flow of the protein. Um, so it's kind of like if a, you, know, you took a Chinese um, uh, kite and waved it around and you just saw that wave, that's, that's what you're seeing here. So this is like one of the first times that people had seen one of these um, in three dimensions. Um, I began working with the Singaporeans. Um, um, this is their lab in Singapore, it's super clean. And it was uh, on the SARS virus. This is when SARS was um, a really huge problem and it was in the newspapers all the time. And so here's the sequence of amino acids uh, for SARS. And this is actually the, the, the SARS virus um, in, in its entirety in a ribbon diagram. So I'm um, like, how do you make, actually physically make that? Well, that's, that's a challenge. So um, what I did was I actually, you know, through talking to a lot of scientists who had actually discovered the protein, 
Um, I isolated the active cleft that they were doing the science um, work with. And so um, they had developed a protease, which is kind of like a plug that you stick in the protein to stop it from catalyzing. Um, so I kind of used a lot of this sort of idea from the Japanese rock garden. I didn't show the entire thing. I just showed the active cleft. And then the protease was this um, rock, rocks that you could walk on. So you became the thing that sort of stopped death in its tracks. And that was, you know, uh, this piece was really, it, to me, it was really intense. It was uh, really about, you know, human inter interrelationship with nature. And um, so here is, I just threw this in because it's kind of a crowd pleaser. This is estrogen. And um, I, I made it al also kind of look like a, a goddess figure with the outside bubble around it, like hearkening back to African goddesses. Um, this is a piece I just finished. Um, and it's um, called Homologous Hope. And it's in a hospital. Um, at UPenn, and um, uh, it's based on the BRAC2 protein. So the BRAC2 protein is kind of like, you're lucky if you have it because it, it repairs damage in your DNA if you're a woman um, that causes breast cancer. And the BRAC1 protein, a lot of people, they can find out, um, you know, you, that you've inherited it, and then you have to... Uh, you know, get a double mastectomy or you're just in trouble. So this was in this uh, atrium designed by Raphael Vignoli and it was huge and light and I wanted it to look like a cloud and there's, um, you can sort of see it here, but an LED display that shows um, the homologous recombination in action. So, okay, so we're gonna get to the word geotherapy now. Um, so it. Geotherapy, um, you know, actually recently, and I'd love uh, for this to be a topic of discussion, people have been saying, Mara, it sounds too much like geoengineering. Um, but um, I don't know if you guys have heard of what geoengineering is, but we can talk about that if you want. Um, but geotherapy is a word that I heard um, when I was working at the United Nations um, for the small island developing states. and. It was developed by a panel of scientists in 1991 in Lyon, France, um, a biochemist named Richard Graham and um, also a cancer researcher named von Rensler Pottier, who said, you know, they, they, they had this panel and, the, and they said, we need to develop a global bioethic that will address the fact that we are in the Anthropocene age, um, we are about to face massive uh, overpopulation, and so, um, there has to be this science-based global bioethic. And um, so that's something that I, I, I started addressing kind of directly in my work, but also I, it's, a, it's a really general term, so it could, it could be applied to science, it could be applied to art, it could be applied to ethics. And um, I just really like it because it doesn't have the same connotations that a lot of um, green washing words do, like even green or sustainability are often commodified, but this is m much more uh, about, uh, you know, um, a belief system. So, uh, so I began the next two bodies of work, and um, the one was really based on uh, bioremediation, um, which um, I, I started working with oysters in particular. Um, uh, and corals because they are living beach breaks and oysters filter water and create habitat and you could also do um, ecotourism so you can bring a lot of money into economies um, as well as sustainable fishing practices. Um, and then I also have been doing another body of work which I'll get to in a moment but that is um, it's actually sequestering toxins for fine art. So a lot of it's made out of uh, uranium-infused glass and, um, oh, oh, okay, and um, plastic. So, um, so I, l I like this idea towards looking to the, 
um, past to see into a healthy future. So uh, New York had um, 500 square miles of oysters, and I also studied a lot of oyster biology. And you can see in this picture here that um, oysters had have these giant gills. So it takes up about you know a third of their body, and um, and so they can uh, filter up to 50 gallons of water per day. Um, so I, I actually was teaching for a while at the new school, and um, we did a lot of science experiments, um, not, uh, not using plastic or concrete to create substrates. So these are just cast uh, porcelain oyster shells and different substrates, and then we worked with Cornell Marine Exchange, and there was like an oyster orgy on our substrates, which was really exciting. And um, it turns out, out of all the substrates, um, arginite, which is the same kind of calcium carbonate um, that's in the inside of a shell, or the nacre, um, works really, really well. I also studied with this gentleman named Wolf Helbritz um, in Indonesia about six uh, months before he passed away. And he was um, an incredible architect and, uh, and sculptor um, and uh, part of this huge community that I, I'm part of called the Global Coral Reef Alliance. Um, and so he, he took off where um, Michael Faraday, who invented uh, the battery and um, electrolysis and kind of coined anode, cathode, ion, uh, took off where he, there was this white precipitate um, on the battery, and that is calcium carbonate, um, so it can accrete like a shell uh, from seawater with light volts of electricity. So um, I'll just quickly go through these. These are a project we did in Indonesia. And it also uh, boosters the immune system of the coral and oysters that grow on it. Uh, it's self-repairing. Um, and three times the strength of concrete. So here is the sculpture transcriptis uh, that we powered up with and is still running with solar panels. It accreted calcium carbonate, you can see here. Um, the, because we wanted to show the public the sculpture, um, it, you know, the oysters, I have to say, could be doing better, <laughs> but uh, What's doing really well, we all also electrified uh, Spartina, which is kind of sucking up uh, toxins from the soil. Um, it grows three times as fast if electrified. And uh, that is kind of like a filter for, um, you know, marshes like a filter for, for shoreline protection. And I'm proud to say that I'm published in this book, um, my first scientific paper, and I also have a chapter on reef design. So this is a, a conglomeration of, of papers that have been written all over the world. Um, this is an SEM of our scanning electron micrograph image, uh, a, a French um, scientist took called Beninger, and it's of a, a oyster gill. And so um, this is something I developed with my students, was this uh, design for an oyster gill reef, so that it has this maximum flow through, and it touches very lightly on the benthic habitat, which is the bottom habitats, because you want sun to reach down there, and it has lots of nooks and crannies for um, fish to live in. And once again, it was this idea that it would grow out and kind of become like a poultice on the planet. So, you know, in 100 years, you just see a he healthy reef, and it's kind of like a, I guess you would say, a performance art sculpture. This is another project I did with the new school students where we gathered oyster shells from Grand Central Station, and we're overwintering them so that they get less disease. So this is, and then, the concept was to put them in the water. So I, I like the idea that there can be this sort of process where, you know, you don't just have a pile of shells. You have uh, a design of shells, and um, it also sweetens the soil. I also wrote this sort of fairy tale book about um, all the experiments I did with the, my students in the New York, New Jersey Baykeeper. Um, and it's on my website if you're interested in the exact details of that. 
Um, so I've been very um, influenced by Ernst Haeckel, um, who worked with Darwin and um, a lot of other artists around the turn of the century. And he was a German um, philosopher, scientist, doctor, artist. And this is um, a map uh, that he drew of protists, which are single-celled. Once again, we're back to a single-cell um, organism. And it's actually really, you know, from his, this kind of drawing, our same, our, we still use for the genus, species, and phylum. So um, he, I'm sure you, you, you've all seen his illustrations, but this is one of them. It's plate 28 from um, Art Forms in Nature. And uh, it is also a protist. And is, is very, as you can see, very decorative. And um, so this is also a ceiling sconce, uh, an Italian ceiling sconce from um, about the same period that was obviously copied from that. So there was this like great, um, you know, combination of art and science. And um, here is, uh, this was torn down, but you can see the Eiffel Tower for the World's Fair in 1900. Uh, architect named Rene Benet um, made uh, this structure, which was based on a radiolarian, which is a kind of plankton. Um, people were also um, making these beautiful slides just as hobbies uh, from plankton. Uh, so there was this real interest in the natural world um, at that time that I found uh, really inspiring. And so I got this idea that I would go collect plankton and make reefs based on um, the plankton that I found in those areas to just show the world how beautiful and great plankton was. And I was sure that the natural design of plankton would um, be great for reefs. This is a, not something I made, but uh, there was a father-son team also named Rudolf uh, and Leopold Belashka, who also worked with this group, and they have um, a huge collection at the Agassiz Museum of Harvard, uh, where I grew up. So I grew up looking at this glass. Um, and you'll see why glass is so important to me a little later. Um, this is a radiolarian reef that I designed. Here's Ernst, and he, his renditions of a uh, tinafore plankton, which is kind of like a little jellyfish, and they eat each other. They're super beautiful when you shine lights on them. When they're alive, they, they look like rainbows. And this is one that I caught myself, and its tentacles are retracted because um, it's scared, and then I killed it. <laughs> so then here is, um, I went to Japan, and I was in the show there. Um, and this is one of the things I collected, which is called star sand. It's for Formenera. It's about 400 million years old. And it's all over the beaches there. And I was in Okinawa, which is really the seat of the Shinto religion. And I, I give like lectures which are much more detailed about my time in Okinawa. Uh, but I'm not going to do that tonight. I'm just going to say that it's a, an extremely spiritual and beautiful place where all the shamans are female. And um, so here is my reef design for them based on a tinafore with star sand on it. And it was an uh, amphibious reef, solar, solar powered. And I also began making um, glass sculptures, um, just some of them of plankton um, at the same time that I was doing all this. Um, these are, I call the ravenous tinafores because um, they're really hungry and beautiful and alive, and I just wanted to show that, you know, part of the ocean is still really healthy. And um, this is some microscopy I did. It's of a cochiopod, um, and cochiopod from Japan, but I did the microscopy in Dublin. And this is another plankton that I found in this oasis um, in a salt lake in Siwa, Egypt. Um, this is. Uh, a, a totally different kind of microscopy, which use, uses, uses layers. Um, and I, I don't think anyone had ever found one of these before, so I named it Mascarati because it looked like eyelashes. And then, um, so here's one of my heroes. His name is Eric Carcenti, and I, um, he is the um, 
chief scientist for this expedition that I par partook in um, called uh, Tara Oceans, but the whole organization is called Tara Expeditions. And he also believes that the planet um, and the atmosphere are uh, like operating in a very similar wa way to a cell. So like all of his science is based on this interconnectedness um, and you know, it's based in ocean things, but um, every, everything is connected. Also, you, you guys should really look out in Science Magazine in the next few months because um, this group is going to publish all their papers and it's going to be a huge scientific breakthrough like we haven't seen in 100 years. <clears throat> They're basically, on this expedition, they were taking the temperature of the ocean and seeing how planktonic uh, ecosystems related to atmospheric climate change. Um, which they do, I mean, plankton, uh, I'll just say this once, but this is so simplified, mean, it, uh, means anything that's f uh, floating in the photic zone, so that's the first 15 feet of water, and, um, and, and it means drifter in Latin, um, and they are the bottom of the food chain, um, they produce at least 50% of our oxygen and also sequester carbon dioxide. So this is a picture of the desert, which looks totally dead. But when iron um, blows off the desert, it creates a plankton bloom. And here's a plankton bloom from outer space. Um, plankton is also nourished uh, from nutrients um, in the deep water. Um, and now that there's global warming, there's a separation between the deep water and the surface waters, so the plankton isn't um, getting en enough nourishment, and they say there's about a 40% decline in plankton since the 40s. So I like to think of the Tara Oceans as, you know, the HMS Beagle from Darwin. It's also a very special schooner. It's made of metal, and it can get locked in ice and travel with the ice for months on end. Um, it's kind of like a sailboat slash submarine. And this is the route they went on. And this is the tip of the boat. Um, so I, I was on there um, off the coast of Chile and it was extremely nutrient rich because it was fed by the Humboldt current. So we saw like a lot of charismatic megafauna, like hundreds of dolphins, sperm whales, flying fish. So this is them <clears throat> towing these giant nets. This is my little net. This is sort of what actually the tinafores look like. Um, they just look like dirt. So you can actually see these guys. They had a lab on board. So this is me and then um, a friend of mine who's looking at um, actually plastic in, in, in plankton. And this is some of the um, plankton that I captured called a tintinid, which is sort of like a mid-range plankton, and it eats um, plant-like plankton. And I made a lot of um, champagne glasses um, that glowed that were uranium because I thought they looked li like little champagne glasses for a mermaid. And this is the picture that's on the, um, the poster, and it's a lithopatera plankton. Um, this is the, I, I fell in love with this plankton, so this is the only one I, I've made that I haven't actually captured myself. It was actually captured in the Mediterranean uh, by a scientist uh, who works with Tara called Christian Sardé. And it's kind of a vegemal, and it's made of strontium, so the green part of so, uh, photosynthesizes, and then um, the crystal part um, is, is, is made, um, of strontium, which is this kind of calcium carbonate, and it travels to the bottom of the ocean and to the top of the ocean every single day, and no one knows why. Um, so this is um, some of my microscopy, and I, I started finding uh, plastic strands, actually, in every single sample from all over the world, and here you can see some plankton stuck to a piece of photodegraded Plastic, and then also here is in um, Okinawa, uh, a four foraminera plankton, but all those strands are plastic. And then I started finding out more and more about plastic. And uh, th this I didn't collect, but um, 
there's also a lot of different kinds of microplastics, like uh, from laundry, from these microbeads that are uh, used for um, fabricating things, also in a lot of cosmetics, uh, facial scrubs. And um, it turns out that they're, f uh, well, they're f uh, lithophilic, which means they uh, get um, like fat and, and they attract uh, toxins which get stored in them. So these pellets, it turns out, have a million times more POPs, which is um, all different kinds of uh, man-made pollutants stuck to, stuck to them than in a, in a regular drop of water. So, um, so here's the horror. Uh, so, I, so, you know, I, of course, I'm an environmentalist, and um, I didn't get into a lot of my advocacy stuff. I, I just figured I'd focus on um, art. But um, I know about climate change, and, but when I saw it through the microscope, it, it, it really came home to me. And I also met Lovelock, um, who is now old, and says, you know, we're all gonna die. And uh, I was trying to tell him about oysters and stuff, and he was just like, doesn't matter, we're all going underwater. So, um, so he wrote The Revenge of Gaia. And uh, so, so I, I got super upset about it and started making this work, um, which is based on um, La Boheme. Um, I call it La Boheme, a portrait of today's oceans in peril. And it's about this tintinid plankton and it's ensnared in plastic, and um, an uh, opera singer sings to it. And I have a video of it, um, and I'm going to talk about that. And we have a whole documentary about the making of it with scientists and stuff at the Morbid Anatomy Museum, um, where we're going to show the film on the 16th, if anyone's interested. Um, so here's the still. Um, so he's, you know, on, on one hand, it's like totally ridiculous because he's in love with a plankton. But I was trying to sort of show that we're all connected, you know. Uh, so she's infused with uranium and has all these dinoflagellate parasites. Um, so here's also a still from the film. And I, I made the plastic uh, look degraded and kind of gnarled. And in, in, in Shintoism, like, you know, straight lines are purity and, and good, and, and crooked lines are kind of evil and bad. And so you, and same is true of like being dirty or clean. So I was trying to really show the plastic as being creepy. Here's some more sculptures from that, which was shown, well, I, well, well also interestingly, the um, ship is owned by a fashion designer named Agnes B. And so we had a show um, of this a couple years ago in our store, which was great. Um, so I came up with this sort of really harsh slogan, evolve or dissolve. And it, I put in a lot of videos. And I was saying it a lot. And then now I'm kind of softening a little bit because, I mean, yeah, w maybe we are all going to die. But um, we are all going to die anyway. But um, there is hope, and I think really, I mean, what I want to say to you as students is really the hope is you guys, and this is somebody that's offered a lot of hope to me. Um, he, I, he not only looks like a J.R. Tolkien character, but he um, has developed this method for collecting marine debris. Um, apparently, there's 5.29 million pieces, trillion pieces of plastic um, using ocean waves. And he's gotten quite far with it. It went viral on TED, and he's at the UN. And this was at the Climate Change March. It's all of these youth. Uh, it says the plankton are rising up. And um, I really love that. And then, of course, there's you know um, the fact that plankton in the past did survive in terrible conditions uh, where the ocean was this acid about 56 million years ago, but um, it had about 1,000 years to um, you know, get to that point. And there, in fact, there is some coral in um, Palau that they've just found that 
uh, is in these super acidic pools, which have, don't have a lot of circulation, that is thriving. In, and so the issue then is like, what is future plankton? So this is an image I made that is future plankton. I call it Ernst after Ernst Haeckel. Um, it sort of brings up the idea, should we bioengineer or is that geoengineering and when, where to draw the line? Um, so the latest piece that I made um, is not, is, is actually, I, you know, I find a little bit, um, uh, I'm a little shy to show it. It's showing in um, Harlem right now at a gallery called Tatiana Paha's Gallery. And um, it's about this concept of accelerated Shingong. So um, accelerated Shingong is, um, well, it's based on this sort of, um, idea of animism. So th these, this is a famous um, Shinto shrine. Um, and, um, you know, here you could, it's called the Wedded Rocks. Um, and it's this idea that, uh, which is really similar to the Gaia theory, which is why a lot of scientists hate the Gaia theory, but that everything is alive. And that uh, the kami, which is like um, the life spirit of things, can inhabit um, certain rocks, certain people at certain times. And if you um, experience Ching Kong, it's like sort of like enlightenment, and you can actually see the kami. So um, in this in this piece, it's like I mean. It's really, I mean, it's really based on something, it is based on my idea that the whole planet is alive and functioning at, like a cell. But it's also based on this other thing where um, when, when you experience Qigong, it's like the kami can pierce through all the different layers of existence and reveal themselves to you. And uh, anyway, this is us making it. It's sort of like uh, glass, super heavy, like lava. This is really elemental. And then we collected rocks in nature. And um, here it is in the gallery. Um, so it's, it's called Supernatural. So it's, it's revealing the kami, which is in a way is like s totally sacrilegious, right? Because like you're supposed to have this experience on your own. But um, I, I just think enough is enough. Like people are so divorced from nature right now that they need to um, have this accelerated Shinkong where we just get in touch with nature super fast so that we can evolve and not dissolve. And uh, yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. <laughs> yes, because I mean, I, f I, I feel like, you know, um, uh, in any truly good work of art, whether it's science related or not, there's a lifetime of experience and knowledge behind it. And so you're really just seeing a little, the tip of the iceberg, like those rocks in the garden that I was showing you. So, and, and, and my hope is that like, you know, people will like the work. And so I, 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 I try to make it look attractive so that they learn more about it and that there, there's many, many layers to it. So the more they learn about it, the more they can learn about themselves and the way the planet functions. But yeah, if someone just says, that's sexy, I like it, I'm totally fine with that, I love that. Um, well, it, it's really, you know, being an artist is pretty hard, like, you know, a lot of times you work really hard and you do these sort of like barefoot science experiments and but really, like right now, I'm not doing that much oyster restoration, honestly. But I was one of the founders of the movement and there is a lot of oyster restoration going on. And that makes me really happy. I mean, yeah, sure, I'd love to do it. But I think that artists a lot of times are like uh, these catalysts and they can bridge um, between the science and the art so that, yeah, you might just say, oh, I really like the way that, that gill sculpture looks. You know, we made a huge one that you can walk inside and stuff, and it, it looks really cool. And then, oh, oh I, I read the blurb. Oh, that's really interesting. Hmm, I want to learn more about that. And then, you know, 
one thing leads to another. So I think, you know, really for awareness, it's really important. And also, like for me, you know, I, I, I do think we've gone be like, I do think that we're going to, we need to like do CPR on the planet as Lovelock kind of talks about. And we might as well do that uh, in a uh, harmonious and beautiful way. So like, I mean, my ultimate dream would be to work with artists and scientists together and put them together. Like, I don't care really about forests that much. I mean, I love them, don't get me wrong, but like, I would love, love to put an artist with a reforester t so that from outer space it looked like some beautiful calligraphy, and it restored the planet. But I mean, a lot of, pe you know, that's a, it's a, just a step beyond conservation. So I'm blabbing on, I'm sorry. But, um, but thanks for the question. So, uh, but it's tough, you know. I mean, I'm basically at the intersection of art and science, and I'll just tell you guys as students, those are both really tough competitive fields, and sometimes you just get smashed like a bug, really. But you have to just keep doing it. Gen space. Go there and try to get a mentor. I'm, I'm actually a member of Gen space, but it go there and go to the lectures and meet that group of people. It's a community biotech lab. So if you guys aren't in school. Uh, it's not very expensive to join it, but you could also just like, if I were you, I would just go and I can, if you come talk to me later, I can tell you who to talk to. Uh, but uh, yeah, I would, that's where I would go. I mean, you know, it, they're very intellectual and, and pretty tough too, but that's, that's, the, that's what's going on. And I know there's another uh, community lab in um, Harlem right now. Uh, I forget what it's called, though. Yeah, I mean, that was like, that. that's why I was like sort of almost embarrassed to show my last piece, because it was all only about that, really. But usually I, do, I don't, and my work is super figurative. But, um, y well, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I. I mean, I could go on about, you know, how repressed we are in Western society, um, but I don't think it would be appropriate, <laughs> maybe another time. But I, I think we really need to get back in touch with nature, and if that's through science, because science is considered um, a reality, then that, then, or, or truth. Even though, actually, to tell you guys the truth, a lot of science is, incredibly subjective and you really have to look at like people's motives in publishing science because even though it could be true it may be only a little piece of the truth and if you knew the entire truth um, it would paint a really different picture but I think that um, in, in in the West a lot a lot of the times like science um, has become this um, ultimate truth, much like God, God-like truth, and I think that should be questioned too. Okay, okay. Even if we totally destroy the planet, it will grow back. Really, what people are fighting for right now is their right to breathe, and 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 quite frankly, I mean. Okay, I'll, I'll just admit it to you guys. I was born in 1971, and the planet was pretty perfect. I mean, I just remember being a little kid in Maine thinking like, wow, you know? And now you go to a beach and there's trash all over it. But the planet will clean itself up. Like, I mean, for example, there was like this oil spill in France like 15 years ago, and um, all these microbes just cleaned it up really fast. And then, um, there, you know, the, the, the Gulf one, they put all this, like, chemicals in, which just killed all the animals and stuff and caused a much bigger problem. So, 
I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I mean, and, and it's like I think it's important, to, even if the planet is dying and we're all going to die, to sort of like take a deep breath and enjoy um, moment by moment. And that is like a spiritual thing. Like there is still so much beauty on the planet and it is a beautiful thing to be alive. And uh, I do have hope and I, 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 you know, uh, honestly, I just feel like we need accelerated Shingong. Like, we can get over tribalism, greed, um, and our dependence on fossil fuels. We just need to embrace nature and the nature in ourselves and every cell in our bodies, and then, and then that could happen. But we, I just don't feel like, you know, I just feel like we just have 10 years to go renewable. It's just like, ah, you know. So it's, it's stressful, but um, yeah. I guess that's a really long, complicated answer. Well, I mean, I avoided galleries for a really long time because I, I thought of galleries and museums as kind of like graveyards where you want to see dead art. And I, w I really wanted to do stuff outside in the public realm. And now I really like this gallery that I just joined in Harlem because it's super community based and I, I don't, f I don't know, I, I, I like, like them and I like that it's in Harlem and stuff. And so, and I really like, uh, Agnes B, I've always liked her clothes, and her history is amazing, and um, the fact that she sponsored this, ha owns the ship is amazing. Um, so I, I was like, uh, felt like uh, simpatico or something. Like, so that's how those things happened. Um, and I like, I mean, like I like academics, institution stuff. Um, because I, I think it's important to um, talk to young younger people. Uh, but you know, honestly, at this point, like if I felt like it was a good situation to be in a museum or something, I I, w I would do it. Like I mean, but it I think I I'm somebody that has usually like you know like actually Katyn like asked me to do something with the new school, and then I started like showing there and coming to her class and talking and stuff. Like I. I and I should maybe maybe this is not the way to be really successful, but I I kind of only go with like the motion that is happening around me, and I I don't usually apply to stuff, which I I know I I should I should probably do it a lot more, but. Okay, thanks very much, you guys. Have a great night.